Hello and welcome to the Aviation Barbecue. Today we're talking about QRA, Quick Reaction Alert, and that's essentially having fighter aircraft on the ground ready to scramble at very short notice to intercept any incoming threats. This year marks the 80th anniversary of the Battle of Britain, and that was one of the clearest illustrations ever of this kind of operation. Today we're going to be talking to former Royal Air Force fighter pilot Ian Black about his experiences flying the Lightning on QRA missions in the UK. Uh, Ian, thanks for joining us. Um, how are you and where are you? Morning, Jamie. I'm, uh, I'm pretty good. I'm uh, not that far from you. I'm in Rygate in Surrey and I've been uh, locked in for three and a half weeks. So I have been let out for one flight. Uh, I'm a pilot with Virgin Atlantic on the Boeing 787 Dreamliner. And I've done one flight to Shanghai to pick up NHS supplies. And I'm going back again tomorrow for a quick 30 hour there and back round robin. Okay. Um, so, I mean, can you tell us a little bit about your career in the Royal Air Force and um, your association with the QRA mission? So, um, I know it sounds a little bit naff, but I am the son of a, a former Air Force fighter pilot because it all sort of adds into the story. Uh, my father was a, a lightning pilot of some renown, uh, but he'd flown meteors and hunters at Wadisham in the 1950s. Uh, then he became a Harrier pilot, which obviously then uh, made me want to become a pilot. I joined the Air Force as a navigator. I'd been in the Army after left school, and uh, I was offered navigator when I went through air crew selection. I took that straight away because I just wanted to leave the Army and stop being an infantry soldier. Uh, my first tour was on Phantoms in Germany in the low-level air defense role, and then I was lucky enough to get a crossover to become a pilot. I did my pilot training, narrowly avoided being uh, selected to be a flying instructor uh, and went to the Lightning on what then became the last Lightning uh, OCU. I did just under two years on the Lightning before it was withdrawn from service and then I went to the Tornado F3. I did uh, five years on the Tornado F3, uh, always at Leeming, um, and then went to the Mirage 2000 exchange in uh, French Air Force Base Orange and then I left and became an airline pilot. Wow. So you've had an extensive experience of quick reaction alert in those various roles. How, how did UK QRA come about? Where did it start? Well, it's, it's an interesting um, question, Jamie, and one which I think there is a book on, on QRA, uh, and it probably can explain it more in more detail than I can. But I'm, I have my own personal theory that um, the QRA concept started um, in the early sort of turn of the century in 1917 or so when the first Zeppelins came across the UK and people realized that we were now vulnerable from attack from uh, other, other countries in our own airspace and over our own country. So they had to devise a way of shooting down Zeppelins over the UK. Then we went into the interwar period um, where uh, things probably just, you know, drifted out of favor. And then we started the Second World War when the Battle of Britain obviously took place. And this is, you know, 80 years since that was, was going on. But that wasn't, you know, they were always on alert there. They were sitting beside their aircraft and they would just get the, the bells to ring and off they'd go. Then after the war, when, it, you know, we won the war and then things turned a bit quieter, the next sort of phase is in the early 50s. And when the Korean War started and things started to hot, uh, hotten up with the Cold War, if that's the right expression, um, we had to have a find a way of defending UK airspace. Initially, uh, it was sort of mainly day fighters with meters, and that's where my father comes in because he remembers in 1952 53 sitting in armchairs <clears throat> by day only with meteors armed with guns and cannons purely as a, a sort of an air defense uh, network to protect the UK by day. And then Wow. The UK uh, air defence network took on the meteor night fighter role, so they had a day and night uh, capability, and then they got the much more capable, dare I say it, uh, Gloucester Javelin. That was a two-man aeroplane, had a radar that worked pretty well, uh, and it had four missiles. So to answer your question, and, and not be like a politician and avoid the question, my first um, thought that QRA really existed was when you got to 1964 to 66 at Lucas. And I've seen photographs of javelins parked on the apron there with four fire streaks on. But the, the day it really starts to me is when they built a dedicated QRA shell at Lucas. Then they built one at Bimbrook and Wadisham, uh, but never at Coningsby, strangely. Uh, wow. And they had two aircraft sitting on alert. So when you had the Mark III Lightning, which was very limited on range, the first actual photographs that I've seen 
of QRE intercepts are Mark III Lightnings with 74 Squadron, with probes uh, intercepting Bisons, and that would be 65, maybe 66. Um, so that, to me, is when the UK air defence system formalised the whole sort of, as you say, quick reaction alert. Okay, I mean... In a nutshell. And Lightning... So Lightning really kicked it off in that case, the, the Lightning era, and that was an era that, obviously, you were involved in the... the, the back end of so i mean what was it like i mean presumably you went and sat queue at bimbrook in a lightning i did and uh that was right at the end in 1987 88 uh before me uh there were two squadrons at lucas which was 11 and 23 from memory and i'm doing this all from memory which was then supplanted by 43 uh, phantoms so the first people who really did uh, or set the sort of the benchmark for Q were 11 and 23 squadron lightning pilots. And they were going off into the unknown, really. They were flying off sometimes with and without overwing tanks, with and without tanker support, uh, and going off miles into the North Sea, northeast of Lucas at night, intercepting Russian bombers. So that was the really, in my, my view, the really sort of uh, the right stuff, you know, seat of the pants type flying. Mm. And purely from their experience, you know, and I've met quite a few of the guys who did it, purely from their experience was when the UK had to formalise, you know, how they had the radar cover to look out over the North Sea, to interact with the Norwegians, to try and make it all coordinated so the Norwegians would pick people up first, then they would tell the RAF. But then there was the whole bigger picture of the Lightning's limited range. And, you know, same as the Phantom, you had to have the Victors, which was called Tanzor, which was tanker operational support, I think, so they had to be coordinated with Q as well. So it, then you had this whole network of like this spider's web where once you alerted two lightnings, it wasn't just two lightning pilots that flew off over the North Sea and intercepted a Russian bomber. It was a whole um, coordinated effort from the RAF of getting the tanker airborne, getting the lightnings airborne, coordinating with GCI, getting the ground crew to get the aircraft serviceable, and then going off and doing the mission. And the mission at the end was to go alongside a Russian bomber and take photographs of it and that was it and also to let them know that we were there so i mean what was it like in a lightning setting off i mean maybe some one of your qra launches i mean you know what what's your recollection of that being in that airplane and going doing it well i mean i this is just sort of the longest part of the story because to, to get to be able to sit on qra you had to become limit operational so when you arrived on a lightning squadron you you know you left the ltf the lightning training flight and you were you thought you were Tom Cruise of Lincolnshire. <laughs> Unfortunately, you were, you were miles from being Tom Cruise. You weren't even goose at that stage. You, know, you were the ab initio lightning pilot who could fly by day, who could fly by night and operate the radar to a limited extent. All the targets that you intercept on the lightning training flight, they never evaded, they didn't do anything, they didn't move in height or azimuth or anything. So when you got on the squadron and you thought you were Tom Cruise, you were in for a big shock because all of a sudden you now had to, to do the job for real. And the, the work up to become limited operational was around about six months. And that was to allow you to sit QRA. And that had a, that had a, a double-edged sword really because it was first to get you semi-operational, but really it was to get the other guys who were on the squadron off QRA because it wasn't a popular thing to go and sit in the QRA ship for 24 hours at a time. You know, you'd arrive at eight o'clock in the morning you spend 24 hours in the queue shed and you couldn't do anything. And it was long before the days of iPhones and media and Facebook and all this sort of stuff. So you literally sat there. You were lucky if you got a paper. You were delivered three meals that Gordon Ramsay would not have been pleased with. <laughs> and that, that was your day. And you sat there and you were supposed to read all the technical manuals and the 11 brief operations books and stuff. But a lot of the time it was extremely boring. So they wanted you to get onto QRA ASAP. But the, the way you got onto QRA by becoming limited operation already was you had to do hundreds of intercepts at medium level. And then the sort of the pièce de résistance was to do what's known as a vis ident, which is a visual identification. And that meant that you could um, do your intercept, get a mile from a target, and then in a very, very controlled way, close between one mile and 200 yards. So that was the sort of the fine tuning of the intercept. So getting to within a mile and getting to within weapon parameters is the easy part and you can fire off a missile and hopefully shoot something down. But the difficult bit is to be able to go from that one mile point stabilized into 200 yards. 
it's fairly easy, I'm saying it here glibly, sat in my armchair in my garden, it's fairly easy going from one mile to 200 yards if the target flies at flight level 320 and he does 302 knots and he maintains a heading 152. However, if the target is weaving and descending and accelerating and decelerating, it all of a sudden becomes extremely difficult. And in the Lightning, the, the workload was, and I'm not just saying this to annoy Harrier pilots because I know they'll be watching and laughing at me, but the workload in a Lightning was extraordinary. And it was probably the hardest thing that a man-machine interface would ever do because there was no, uh, no computer technology to help you at all. So you were literally flying this Mac 2 aircraft at the same time as interpreting a three-inch radar tube and looking at a little tiny orange phosphorus blip and seeing what it was doing and, and just the small nuances that it would you know, be drifting slightly to the left or moving slightly to the right or coming down the scope a little bit faster than you thought that would give you this, oh my goodness, he's not doing 300 knots, he's doing 250 knots. So it was an extremely exacting art of flying, far, far more difficult than being a Harrier pilot. And that, so that, that's so, to talk about the radar into visual phase of doing that. Yeah, so the, the Visi Dent, as I'm saying, so you, when you became limit operational, the final check of your um, ability to become a single seat QRA qualified pilot was to go off with an instructor in the T5, so you sat side by side, uh, with no notice. So you'd sit on the pan at Bimbrick, you'd be scrambled off, and you'd be vectored to a target somewhere over the North Sea that you were not aware of, and you had to intercept it and then close to 300 yards at night with the lights out. So with GCI's help, you do the intercept, you do all the intercept, get behind the target. The guy sitting next to you would say nothing. You would then lock on to the target when you were behind him and then close with his vis ident. And that's really, you know, I, I could talk for 20 minutes and bore you for the rest of your life talking about the intercept from um, two miles astern to 200 yards. But you literally had to get that one mile and then you would start the stopwatch. You'd look at your speed, so say you were doing 300 knots, you'd time the closure over, say, a minute. So if you were at a mile, one minute, and then you suddenly found yourself at half a mile, a minute later, you could then work out what your closure rate was and then try and calculate his speed. Once you'd calculate his speed, if he was on a heading of, say, north of 360, you would fly 360. And if the target started to wander out to the left, then you knew that his heading wasn't 360. If the target stays exactly on your azimuth, then you know his heading is 360 and you nail that heading. So once you've nailed the heading and the speed, you then look at the height. So you're trying to then say, well, I think he's at 350. And by looking in the radar, you have two elevation markers. So uh, I, can, I can show you that the radar hand control, but once you look at the elevation uh, being at zero, you know your co-altitude with him. If the elevation is showing one degree up, you can work out what his range is using the one and 60 rule of how high he is. Now, in peacetime, um, as part of the training, you would get behind the target and you would stabilize. And I can't remember exactly what the ranges were, but I'd have to look at a book. But say you were at a mile and you'd say, um, you know, rooster one is um, one mile stabilized. And then you would close. Closing for this ident would be the call. And then once you were in a, in a stabilized position, the, the target would repeat. You'd say, I'm at 350, three, three, I'm heading 160, and I've got 350 knots. And that was a safety rule so that, you know, you didn't come in at 450 knots and go cruising up the back of him. So once you were then stabilized with him, you could sit behind the target and then you inch your way very gingerly into your 200, I think it was 200 or 300 yard position to then get a vis ident. Okay. Now, you've got to remember that if it's a, a clear day, like today, Jamie, you know that you could see the target, a bear, from 25 miles away. But you're looking at the worst case scenario. So you're looking at nighttime in cloud, possibly with no moon or a very little moon, so no references and certainly no night vision goggles. And all you have in your cockpit is a torch and a probe light. Uh, can you see? I've got a probe on this airplane, but there's a little light on the probe, so you might have something to illuminate it. And then once you get into your sort of like a quarter of a mile, it's then all fine tuning and it literally becomes um, like an instrument rating test. So you fly, you're looking at the radar, you're locked onto it, you're watching the target come down and you're trying to maintain, say, 10 knots of closure. So you've got 350 knots 
on the target. You've got 360 knots and you're looking in, you're going, okay, I've got 360 knots. He's at 350, I've got 10 knots to close. And then you're just fine tuning all those last parameters. You know he's on a heading of say 360. So you're maintaining the heading as accurately as you can, plus or minus half a degree, literally half a degree. You're maintaining the speed of say 350, plus or minus 10 knots. And then you're watching the height like a hawk as well. And you want to get behind the target and then once you're fully into that position of, say, 300 yards or 200 yards behind the target, then and only then do you look out of the cockpit and then you look for the target and see where he is. And then you're trying to identify him and you might want to be going, well, I'm going to put him on the left-hand side slightly or the right-hand side, depending where the moon might be. So if the moon was in the right one o'clock, you would offset to the left. So you're going to look out the right-hand quarter light and then you can see the shadow of the bear for this example in uh, silhouetted by the moon yeah or you might want to have the moon illuminate him because what you want to do is the first thing that gci will say is what is the aircraft type and then they'll probably ask for what's the serial number which you may or may not transmit yeah. and the whole reason jumping ahead slightly is once you've identified the target then if it's a bear delta and it's number tail number say 42 then all the little intelligence people down in London, as it was then, they will note that Bear Delta number 42 was on the 15th of April heading down towards Cuba. They will then track it with the Americans going off the East Coast, and they will then notice that Bear number 42 will then track back up the East Coast of America three weeks later, and they'll know that, you know, the Russian cruiser had three weeks in Cuba. But they did all sorts of sneaky things. Like, you know, they might have number 42 go down and then they'll repaint it in Cuba and then yeah. put number 64 on. So 64 goes back up and the Americans say, well, where's 64 come from? So there was a whole load of cat and mouse type stuff that went on that, you know, we weren't totally privy to all of the time. Um, all we had to do was do our job of identifying the aircraft yeah. and, you know, what, what its serial number was. It's amazing. I mean, that, that, I've never really... I, you always kind of think of QRAs a nice clear day and going and doing a nice sort of visual intercept and cruising in alongside. But of course, when you've got limited avionics, limited visibility, you know, obviously that all comes into play. And did that did that change when you got onto the F three? I mean, did was there new technology that made it simpler? Um, the the basic principles of doing a vis ident didn't change, and we had various vis ident. Uh, codes. So vis, I think it was a vis ident phase one was day VMC. A phase two, I think, was night with lights out on, and then a phase three was the most difficult one, which is night lights out. So we would, and again on training, we would close to say a thousand yards, lights on phase two, and then we would call lights out, and the target would then turn its lights out, and then you had to close with no lights onto the target. But when you're talking about you know, not realizing how complicated it was, and I probably need a piece of string and a and a ball to show you, but when I was doing the lightning training flight conversion, one of my um, most scary moments was doing a vis ident at low level over the sea against a target. Uh, and it was one of the uh, weapons instructors on the LTF who had a bit of a reputation making life difficult for me, or for me, but for everybody. But he was sitting just below a level of cloud at, say, a thousand feet. And I was in a single seater doing one of my second or third vis idents. And I, I must admit, you know, I was completely and utterly maxed out. I would put my hand up to this. So, you know, I, I basically, I couldn't fly accurately, accurately enough to get to that 300 yard point. And if you imagine that it's um, for those people that fly and they do an ILS, an instrument landing system, that when you're 20 miles out from the airfield, any movements on this, like, like this large piece of string, I'm using my pen here, any movements on your ILS at 20 miles don't make any difference. So if you move 10 degrees, it's only a little tiny movement like that. If you now get to within 200 yards of a target and you move by one degree or two degrees, the radar blip can move from your center line to 20 or 30 degrees off in yeah. two seconds. Same with your speed. And I was sitting in cloud with this guy sitting below the cloud. So I was completely blind to him. But because I wasn't flying accurately enough, the blip was just moving from sort of 20 left to 30 right. And, you know, I wasn't, and then I was getting uh, the speed, uh, losing control of the speed. So I've, you know, about accelerate up 10 knots, come back 10 knots. And <laughs> I can say this now because it's, you know, 20 years later, but yeah. my little blip, it was like milking a mouse. It was just <laughs> so difficult. And so my blip was just all over the shop. And eventually I caught a glimpse of him through the cloud and I thought, 
well, you know, screw this. I'm just going to watch him and look at him. Yeah. But when I came back, I knew that if I had my film developed, which, um, you know, using one of my props, this would be the film out of the radar camera. And after the sortie, you would take this to the, um, the, the photogs. They would develop it and then they would debrief your film. I had to pay this guy, well, I come in what was then probably 10 quid for a crate of beer and say, you know, when you develop my film, could you just expose it and then undo it and, and, and fog it and just completely ruin it? Because I know that if I'd have, if he'd have looked at my film, he would have gone absolutely ape shit. He would have looked at that film and I'd have failed that trip because, you know, it wasn't the stabilized blip moving down the radar tube. It was just all over the place, like a swinging piece of string, a sausage on a piece of string. And it was, you know, it would have been dangerous because there was no way that I was ever stabilized and doing all, all the intercept in a controlled fashion. So for the price of 10 quid, that, that film had to be destroyed. <laughs> and I had, to, I, had to re, I had to refly the sortie again and live fine. <laughs> it, it, it taught me a lesson that, you know, you had to fly plus or minus one degrees, plus or minus two or three knots, and plus or minus 10, 15 feet on the height. Otherwise, you just got this, you know, blip that was all over the shop. That's amazing. So what is your, do you have a particular QRA mission that stands out in your mind, a best QRA memory? Well, I mean, sadly, I don't remember launching on the Lightning uh, to do a live scramble. So I never saw anything um, on QRA as a live intercept from the Lightning, sadly, because I probably only did about a year when I was actually Q qualified. Uh, and it was only until, strange enough, the very last day of Lightning operations that the Russians, they launched about six bears. It, it was spooky that about six bears came down, down the North Sea on the very, very last day. And we were launching Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4. Uh, and I wasn't flying that day, so I didn't intercept it. So I didn't see my first bear until uh, I was on 25 Squadron Tornado F3s and from Leeming. And I was flying with quite an experienced navigator. And I must have been in the Air Force for in 88, nearly 10 years. And I'd always been air defense. And my, my whole raison d'etre for being in, in air defense was to intercept the Russian or shoot one down. You know, that, that was the thing. That's why we were there. That was not likely to happen, but oh, good. to see a Russian in the Cold War was the height of, you know, what you're doing for your job. Yeah. And we got, we got launched in a, an F3 uh, with big tanks on, and we cruised out over the North Sea, headed, at, I don't know, I guess, sort of zero two zero, so probably went to the tanker. That bit's a bit vague. Uh, and then we got handed off from Bulma in Northumberland to Buchan in Scotland. And then there was something where we handed off to... I think it was a Danish in the Faroes Islands, Polestar it was called, and we got handed off from various radar stations to various radar as we got further north and went out of range. And we knew that, um, that there were two Russian bears coming down uh, off the North Norwegian coast. And this was my moment, you know, and I had my Nick on beside me, you know, my back seat that had his, his trusty little Pentax there, but I had my Nick on and I had my Kodachrome loaded. I had spare Kodachrome and I had my 50 mil 1.4 lens on there. And this was going to be my day. So finally, you know, after 10 years, we could just see this glinting silver, big, big four engine Russian bomber. Wow. When, and which year was that? Um, I honestly can't remember. I think it must have been pre Gulf War one. So probably 89, 90. So okay. I, I, I joined my first squadron in Germany in 1984. Yeah. So it would have been yeah six or eight years. No, 81 I joined first one. So it would have been nearly 10 years. And I'd, I'd waited for that moment. I'd sat QRA in Germany or Battle Flight. I'd sat QRA at Denbrook. I was now doing QRA at Leeming. And there was no way that I was going to miss that. But I mean, you know, things have changed. And we, we did do things, you know, we would do things that we would go um, silent scrambles. So we would we'd get airborne and, and just go off. And then they'd give you a punch clear to to go to a certain frequency and then we just get a, a vector and a, a call sign and that would be it so it, it wasn't uncommon that we would lose comms and we did have some degree of autonomy i mean today you know i don't know what their rules of engagement are but the the, the civil airliner threat and hijacking threat is all is that, i mean that wasn't really we we were there to to intercept russian bombers you know yeah. the thought of a hijack was never really on our cars the, the possibility of an airline losing its radio or lost that that was a possibility certainly in germany yeah. but a hijacked airliner and trying to um you know i mean that must be the hardest job in the world being a typhoon pilot and then having to intercept an airliner and then making you know split second decisions where it's heading to where it's going to what your rules of engagement are which is obviously 
uh, classified, but yeah. you know, it's a huge responsibility of what they do now compared to what we did, although hitting a Russian bear would have been you know, pretty bad news. So going back to the viz I don't think, the whole thing that we did it so religiously and so carefully was that you know, the very thought that a night of a Russian bear at low level, I don't know, in cloud or something, of you actually hitting it and making it crash into the sea, you know, yeah. the, the implications could have been massive. And, you know, and they tried to do the same to us. They would try and fly us into the sea as well. They would you know, descend very gradually. And I, I wasn't sadly on any of the Lucas squadrons where they were intercepting you know, 20 bears a week sometimes. But they would tell you stories that they would, they would intercept bears at night at, uh, I don't know, say 2,000 feet, and they'd get behind them, they'd get to sort of 300 yards, get to that vis end point, and then the bear would just very gradually, 100 feet a minute, just very gradually start descending down to 500 feet over the sea, hoping that you would be, because you're always sort of sitting maybe below or above, hoping they would fly you into the sea. And, I mean, hats off to the Russian bomber pilots. I mean, they were 2,000 miles from their main base and descending with probably no radar altimeter with a... a uh, pressure setting that they probably didn't know what it was yeah. but they were quite happy to go down over the sea at night and try and fly you into the sea and see how sharp you were so it, it was a bit more than you know cat and mouse there was there were the bad guys out there as well yeah yeah absolutely well uh, this is the aviation barbecue and uh, so the obvious question is did you have barbecues on the QRA you know, at lightning on lightnings or on F3s was, was barbecue ever a factor <laughs> I think, you know, food and cooking has become a bit of a thing of the, the modern age, isn't it? And my only recollections, and, and I, you know, it's, it's prearranged you ask me this question, is that I've got a, a few recollections of barbecuing and cooking. One was uh, in Germany where we would have our three meals a day and they were called hot locks. And I can't remember what hot locks stood for. And I'm sure one of the grand crew who probably watched this would tell me. But they used to go to the airman's mess and there would be little tins and in those tins would be your food, and then you'd have to reheat it. And if you were really, really good, they would give you a piece of steak you could cook yourself. And so this would arrive in the Grand Crew cook it for you. But the steak, I don't know what animal it came from, but I don't know if it, people ate zebras in 1984, <laughs> but it certainly wasn't a fillet steak that you and I know. It was, it was totally unedible. You, know, you, could, you could line your shoes with it, and it would last for months, but you certainly couldn't eat it. I, I do, I think we probably did, and it was the usual sort of military thing. You'd get a 40-gallon drum, cut it in half, and then put it on a couple of poles and fill it full of charcoal, or normally we filled it full of um, pallets and just burnt bits of wood in there and then and cooked over it. But I remember lightning ground crew, they would light the barbecue with the ass pin that they started the aircraft with, and this is a mono-combustible fuel. And you know, the very thought of anybody, health and safety-wise, starting a barbecue with ass pin it's similar to you know the old German uh, V2 rockets and comets. Of you know once you light that stuff, you cannot put it out. So it just oh keep, it burns without oxygen. So they were pretty good at that. But I I think maybe <laughs> the French Air Force we used to barbecue a reasonable amount. And again, it was um, forty gallon drums with just planks of wood in there and cooked fillet steaks and stuff and, and rump steaks. But I seem to remember in, I remember once going. It was more how much beer you could drink rather than how much food you could eat in those days. <laughs> And, and it was like, you know, the barbecue consisted of a sausage, a chicken wing, and a piece of steak, and that was it. And there was no trimmings. That, you know, that was what you had to eat. And presumably all burnt as well. Yeah, to a crisp. You know, it was um, <laughs> <coughs> cremated to, to within an inch of its life. It, was, it wasn't toasty, that's for sure. And there was no salad ever eaten with it either. And, I mean, we used to spend a lot of time in Cyprus, so we would have um, barbecues there, I guess. But, um, you know, I, I think it would have been not not seen as very pc for anyone you know making a little sauce with it or something or <laughs> well, i'm not going to make any sauces today i'm not going to it's uh, it's i'm going back to basics with uh, with hot dogs today so uh, we'll uh, we'll yeah, hot... have a look at that in a minute but certainly going you know doing american exchanges as well going to Hahn or bitburg and things that they were they were the kings of barbecues and you know, the hot dogs and burgers for them was, was was more of their forte but for the brits no we were we weren't the, the great barbecue people in the cold war um, there, won't be, there won't be a book coming out of that, that's for sure. <laughs> thank you so much for your, the insight. Um, it's just absolutely fantastic talking to you, and uh, I really appreciate your time. And uh, pleasure. To see you. You too. Thanks a lot. Small world. See you again soon. Cheers, Tony. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Rich, I mean, that, I really enjoy talking to a black yeah. man about that stuff. I think the thing that really, really 
got me was I hadn't realised the complexities of an intercept because you kind of think, you know, you think it's going to be nice weather, you can just yeah. see the target and just kind of cruise in. But, you know, talking about that aircraft underneath a cloud layer and things like that, I mean, yeah. there's so many parts to it, I didn't realise. I know, and then you add in the type of airplane you were flying as well. So, like, the guys that do it today, obviously, very high-tech radars and equipment and everything else, but that, that thing was a rocket ship, wasn't it? And the, the precision from, I think you were saying, like, two miles to 200 yards, that precision to get that close and that fine, getting that, the right targets in, all in line with everything else, and this tiny little radar scope. It was quite amazing, quite an amazing feat, really, of airmanship. It's, and it just shows how things have evolved over the years, doesn't it? You know, it's a really good illustration from the lightning through to yeah. the three and now where yeah. we are with the typhoon and i mean do yeah. you, in terms of how I, mean, I guess it still kind of happens in the same way today though in terms of you know the reporting, yeah. reporting structure and things like that yeah i mean there's a huge picture of it all together isn't there the whole network i mean there's there's like a, a, a civilian science there's military science there's intelligence services all working together not just in the uk either but all across europe to watch what's happening at any one time and then they'll make the call they'll make the call as to the security level involved and the intelligence level involved as to what needs to happen next. And that, that call will go down through the chain. So the radars will pick, pick up the, the threat, uh, the thing that needs investigation. Let's be, let's be real as well, it's not always a threat. It may be some, a civilian aircraft that's in trouble that's not communicating as well. So they'll, they'll pick up that, that signal and that will get fed through the, the network and the reporting centers directly into the Typhoon squadrons of the two RAF bases that we have. And then there'll be a standing, a standing crew ready to, to roll. You know, they'll be on 24-hour shifts or 48-hour shifts, depending on, on what, it, what it's like nowadays. But um, then there'll, there'll be minutes to react. You know, they'll be all ready to go. They'll, they'll sprint to the jets, start the engines up. They'll be flight prepped, ready to go, and, and head into the heavens to, to investigate what's happening. All the time, they'll be fit, being fed information as well. So it won't be a case of, you know, getting up there and seeing what's there. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be forming picture as, as they as they perform the intercept all the time that's one of the big differences i suppose isn't it you know when you look at a typhoon today again a qra monster like the lightning was you know yeah. gets into the air really quickly climbs to altitude really quickly it can get yeah. there very very fast um, yeah. but also now typhoon's got things like data link you know they'll be looking yeah. at their data link, yeah. and you'll be looking at tracks and stuff actually yeah. in the cockpit whereas the lightning you're looking down that tiny little scope yeah. You know, yeah. to look at an orange pit. I mean, it, it's it's come a long way since those days, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. I mean, in, in the real sort of hot areas like South and the Baltics, for example, they, they they actually form the picture as they as they as they're zooming out on the on the zoom climb up to you know sixty thousand feet, whatever. It's 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 an incredible thing that they wouldn't necessarily even know what they're going up against until that they actually see it, and they, you know, all that picture being built as they as they zoom out must be such a rush. I mean, that, as Ian said, it's kind of what they're. They're, they're made for, isn't it? It's their moment. He was—he wanted to to intercept those bears for so long, didn't he? And uh, yeah, glad he got <laughs> glad he got the chance to do it in yeah. in, in you know, his way. It's one of the core missions of the RAF, and obviously, you know, still yeah. during the lockdown period, it's it's one of those things that yeah. will be continuing. It's a really important thing. We don't know too much about it, and not much is said. And it's it's still QRA is a really kind of a still a quite a classified thing what you know how it operates and what goes into yeah. it you know it's still yeah, pretty secretive so we don't know an awful lot about it but great to get that kind of insight into what happened in the in the 80s you know from me yeah it. yeah totally totally it was quite interesting seeing when we first went into lockdown that there was um there was a, a i think there was a couple of bears that came over wasn't it down down in the, the north sea and we had to intercept them very early on so it, it as you said it is a little bit of a game of cat and mouse they like to test our readiness in different situations like again like i had a lot of experience having the baltics and they they will test when a, when a new nation comes on and takes that mission they'll, they'll test it they'll go on on day one and then they'll try it on a friday night at last thing and they'll try it on a sunday morning first thing you know just to see what the reaction times are so there, there is still a bit of gamesmanship going on as well i guess so what, one, one of the things that grabs me as well you know we're talking about the, the whole precision of the flying and everything else is presumably where his photo skills came from as well because yeah. obviously you know one of the few people to have actually taken amazing air to air yeah. photographs while still flying whilst flying the airplane which is in a tiny cockpit i mean that thing is is right shoulder to shoulder and he's there with a big camera and sometimes medium format stuff as well you know and that's that's no mean feat. So I loved no it when he talked about it. Well, I was flying a very complicated jet as well. Yeah, 
with yep. his nickel on loads with uh, Kodachrome and oh it was just it was just magic magic stuff I also um, love the fact he, he actually praised the Russians at the end as well didn't he so look you know this this was good flying but they, they also had some skills there as well to do their mission so yeah that's a really nice touch Rich thanks very much once again and uh, look forward to catching up with you again soon uh, for those of you who want to read more about QRA, the April edition of Air Forces Monthly has got a real insight into the current UK operations and also QRA operations internationally. Thanks for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon.